what is going on everyone welcome back to another swift video in today's video we're going to be going over what's new in swift 5.3 that was recently released so uh, here we are on swift.org which has the major changes listed out and you can see the date on this is september 16th so uh, not too long ago so if we scroll down here we see a list of uh, the new features and whatnot. So I'm not going to go through every single one if, with an example, but I will call out uh, the interesting ones that are probably going to be most relevant to most of you guys. So you can see a list here, things with strings change, uh, comparable. The interesting thing um, that a lot of people have been talking about is uh, multiple trail enclosures. So we'll take a look at this. We'll also look at this multi uh, pattern uh, catch clause. Uh, some enum changes going on down here and so on and so forth so that said make sure you destroy that like button as always hit subscribe open up a playground and let's do some examples with some of these quick pause before we get into the video if you haven't seen it already i am hard at work putting together iosacademy.io a community where all of us ios engineers can come together learn how to build some of the top apps like facebook YouTube and Instagram, in addition to interview prep to land some of these iOS roles at top tech companies. So if you're interested in the free and premium content to come, head on over to iosacademy.io and enter your email address in the waitlist form and you will be notified as content becomes available. That said, let's get into the video. All right, so I've got a playground to open up here and we're simply importing UI kit. And the first one I figured we would start with is multiple trail enclosures. So I'm gonna be popping back and forth through uh, between uh, Xcode and uh, Swift.org here. So if you actually click on any of these uh, links next to uh, the change, you'll see quite a bit of information about uh, the motivation behind the change, what was done, in-depth explanation, all that good stuff. So we'll definitely be referencing this, uh, A, for my learning and understanding, and B, to give you guys some context on why things changed. So multiple trail enclosures. So given a function with the closure, so let's do UI view, uh, animate with duration. So we've got this with duration, and we're gonna use one to one, with a completion handler. So we're gonna say animate with duration and completion. And uh, before Swift 5.3 introduced multiple trail enclosures, uh, we could only use a trail enclosure for this completion block down here. So we would do something like this. And we'd say if uh, done, uh, do something like that, right? So animations here, and in this case, uh, finished animations. Now, multiple trail enclosures uh, shorthands this a little bit more, and this has become kind of a topic of controversy. But basically, what you can now do is animate with duration and the completion. Uh, one, which is this. Let's say we pass in one. Now, both of these are closures. So if you simply hit enter, let's see what this does. So you can see that it actually closed the function body right here. Uh, with uh, the first parameter, which is an integer, and our animations will go here, and our completion uh, was basically this last one here, which also takes this one parameter, and let's see if we can actually get away with doing this uh, for the parameter. Actually, we cannot, so if you actually come over here to uh, the browser, you'll see the proposed solution. They actually use the exact same example, uh, animate with duration. They talk about uh, multiple trail enclosures. Uh, they talk about what you can do with this case. So here we have uh, the argument label for the first closure. And this is the older way to do it with a trail enclosure just for completion. Um, and they talk about the design and kind of what led to this. Uh, so yeah, that's multiple trailing closures. So we can definitely create our own functions with uh, as many closures as you want. Uh, oftentimes, some functions have uh, up to two, having more than like two or three in a function is not that common, but I suspect with this new uh, kind of syntactical sugar coat uh, that's introduced here, we're gonna start seeing uh, designs of functions that are really 
uh, kind of promise based. So if you're familiar with JavaScript promises, so one async task after another, um, so that's multiple trailing closures. So if we come back to this list here, the next one that I wanted to touch on was uh, multi-pattern catch clauses. So this one's pretty interesting as well. Uh, basically, right now, uh, prior to 5.3, we would have to do a do catch with a try statement in here. And if we wanted to catch uh, a error, we would basically not be able to do this, right? So something in today's uh, sub 5.3 world is uh, we would do something like this, right? So we would do a do catch. And if an error occurred in the catch, right, an error was thrown, uh, to get the particular error out uh, in terms of figuring out which error actually occurred and what our code should do, we would need to switch on the error. So it's not really uh, that concise. It's a little verbose and there's a lot of duplicity going on here. So, you know, naturally the language progression is uh, we can actually just catch uh, multiple errors uh, in this fashion with multiple catches like this. So let's look at an example here, if I can think of one real fast. So let me actually leave this here. We can actually just move down here. So we're gonna say uh, do catch changes. And let's have a function here. Um, let's just actually create a struct called thing and make it codable. And we'll use this, we'll use JSON decoder as our uh, function that's gonna throw. So let's say we had a func uh, do things. And uh, let's say we had a do catch in here. And we're gonna do try JSON decoder. We're gonna decode. We're gonna decode, let's see, uh, from data, which will be empty data. And we're gonna decode thing dot self. Now this call to JSON decoder is uh, capable of throwing, so we could catch it here. So if we actually come over here to the browser, you can see that you can actually catch the particular error, same as before, but in this case, you can have uh, multiple like this. So let me actually go ahead and simply grab this, and we're gonna throw this right here. And this is gonna complain because I don't think we have, we, well, we need to define task error first and foremost. And let's just comment that there, comment that there. And we're gonna create an enum. It's gonna be an error and we're gonna throw in these cases in here. So we're gonna have this one, we're gonna have this one. And finally, we're gonna have this one. So the beauty of this uh, is that, well, these two actually take, need to take associated values. So we're gonna say, string and string and these should go away let's see we've got let message so we're, basically it's complaining that we're not using this here uh, and on this slide is complaining error thrown from here are not handled let's see uh, because in closing catch okay so basically the reason this error is being shown here uh, we can ignore it for now but basically the swift compiler is smart enough to say this is going to throw an error that is none of these, right? Like it's not a task error, which is why it's complaining. But what I wanted to kind of exemplify here is now this catch statement is a lot more uh, in line with what we currently do with a switch statement. So if I can find it, let's see. So in, this is the change in the switch statement currently, we would basically switch on the error itself in one of these catches. Uh, but now we can have these two catches. And for both of these errors, we wanna do one operation. In this case, it would be show a message. And in a some recoverable error state, we wanna do some recovery function. So this is the change uh, in 5.3 to make this A just more concise and B uh, kind of just more uh, in line with what you would expect the language to offer. So that's how that would work. Um, let's see, what else? So if we come back to the browser here, let's see what else we've got going on. So did set, there's a did set change in here for refine did set semantic. And for those of you who uh, uh, know how did set works under the hood, basically whenever the did set setter is called, Swift always calls the old value um, 
in it, right? So like if you take a look at the motivation here, it says currently Swift always calls the properties getter to get the old value even if we have, uh, if we have a did set observer, even if the observer doesn't refer to old value, right? So you might not think it's a major issue uh, under the hood, but once this, uh, this calling of a getter scales, uh, they actually show an example further down here, but basically once it scales, it's using up memory to call, call old value even if we're not using old value in the did set itself. So the refinement here, and actually we can probably get away with copy and pasting this, the refinement here is completely under the hood and there's no syntactical change. But now when you call, uh, when you assign bar in this case, uh, did set of course is called, so we're gonna be printing out uh, did set called, but old value is never referenced in here and thus under the hood, Swift is not going to allocate memory for it. So it's definitely a semantic uh, performance improvement uh, and really kind of, uh, as the language is mature, uh, Swift now basically is smart enough and also just kind of semantically knows old value is not being referred to in here, hence we really shouldn't be allocating memory for it. So that is the did set change. Let's see, what else should we run through? So this one is also pretty uh, controversial and interesting. So this is implicitly capturing self in a closure. So what the heck does that mean? So if we have a closure, and let me actually add some comments here, and let's do self capture. So let's say we have a class called uh, person, takes an initializer, doesn't really do anything. And let's say there is a do something in here, and it has a completion uh, closure, which takes no parameters and returns a void. And let's say we have another function here and we'll call it thing. And we say do something. And let's say we, we have a property on here called uh, name is Joe. Previously, if we wanted to refer to name, we would have to say self.name. And basically the self is referring to the class here and uh, the confusion, rather the, the issue of confusion stems from capturing uh, strong self in this closure, which causes a retention cycle. So what we would have to do is do weak self in, and we would make this optional, or you could uh, bind it in a guard statement. But basically what we can now do is we can simply use self directly in here if there uh, is a strong correlation that a uh, retain cycle will not occur. So here we're, they have some examples of uh, how this is gonna change. Here's the motivation around it, how there's self everywhere um, and how you really don't need it. So if we actually just get rid of this and get rid of this, and let's go ahead and make this a var so we can mutate it. We can now simply uh, say name equals Dan. And you'll see that there shouldn't be an error that pops up uh, because the self is uh, being implicitly uh, inferred by the language for you, where previously, prior to Swift 5.3, it would basically complain at you and uh, say that implicit self uh, needs to be explicitly marked. And I think they actually even show the error here. Um, if you currently try to do it, you would get this error. Reference to property, uh, X in closure requires explicit self to make capture semantics explicit. So uh, these two closure related changes, the self capture here and the multiple trailing closures are by far the changes that are gonna be the most common all over the place in the wild. Uh, of course, these other things are as well. But those are the two that I absolutely wanted to call out. And let's see what else we've got here on our list. I think we're pretty close to wrapping up. So enum cases with protocol witnesses. This is pretty interesting too. I don't think I'll do an example here, but just to run through it really fast. Um, let's see what the motivation is. So currently Swift is a very restricted protocol witness matching model where a protocol witness has to match exactly with the requirement. Um, and some exceptions, right? So basically they're loosening up how protocol witnesses work. So uh, here's an example prior. And with enums, there's a lot of issues with protocols and matching and comparable and things like that. So this goes over all about those semantics. Uh, most people probably won't see it that often, but definitely interesting. Uh, at main is a type-based program entry point, very similar to other languages having a main interface. 
So if we take a look at this here, we can simply annotate things at main, propose solution, right? You've got a public protocol here and we've got a annotation of at main for the program. And for those of you who have uh, touched Swift UI at all, uh, or some of the newer Apple things that are going on, you've probably already seen this uh, show up in Xcode via one of Apple's templates. Uh, forward scan matching for trail enclosures. Let's take a look at this one. Uh, so basically this is how trailing, uh, multiple trail enclosures uh, kind of works uh, under the hood. Uh, this is kind of in line with that and this and multiple trail enclosures go hand in hand. So multiple trail enclosures can be inferred by the compiler. So that's basically all I wanted to cover without kind of going on through every single one. Um, I would encourage you guys that are interested in this to definitely pull up this page, read through it, play with the playground. I'll be pushing this up to GitHub. And uh, yeah, that's really it. Let me know what your guys' thoughts are on some of these uh, changes, like multiple trail enclosures, uh, the did set semantic, the uh, do catch, I think is interesting, as well as this uh, self capture. So that said, thank you so much for watching. If you haven't destroyed the like button, make sure to do so as always. Hit subscribe if you haven't done that yet. Comment down below with any questions, suggestions. If you just want to say hello, thanks for watching. And I'll catch you in the next one.